represent the millions all over the United States. The so-called Arab Spring. Trying to figure out what they're trying to say. Bring to the fore another debate about the strategy. Is it right? Or wrong, and that's something that will Libyan police. Wall Street protests that are entering their third week in New York. Because they see those leaders are killing the That we'd be in jail. All right, they call it a racket, a scam. In some cases, changed their nations forever. About ninety thousand pages of documents that were millions more. I think everything has changed. I think everything has changed because we now have. What's going on out there? The start of the 21st century will likely be remembered as a time of great social upheaval. New global movements have risen to the forefront of public attention. WikiLeaks, which fights the tyranny of government secrecy and deception. The Arab Spring is a way to challenge the oppressive regimes of the Middle East. The Occupy protests against social and economic injustice. And hacktivist groups with a social agenda, like Anonymous. Each opening new modes of liberatory expression. The last time the United States had this pervasive national atmosphere of social change was during the 60s. Widespread discontent with U.S. military, social, and economic policy culminated in student protests and marches on Washington. The movements now address similar issues, but it seems in radically different ways, through different avenues which take advantage of the technological advances of the past 40 years. What are the defining characteristics of these modern movements? To investigate, we traveled to Occupy DC in McPherson Square in Freedom Plaza. Buried amongst the monolithic towers of the political elite, the Occupy DC camp stands in stark contrast to its urbanized surroundings. The camp is a cluster of tents, chairs, tables, serving as information centers, libraries, kitchens, and community assembly spaces. The occupiers were friendly and were more than willing to offer their perspectives on the issue of social change. Two in particular had much to say. Robert, who was drawn to the camps after losing his job due to an injury, and Barry, an organic it's farmer about from Florida. What is right and what is wrong, and it's about addressing those issues. And the most oppressed are the people without jobs and that are homeless, but People are really waking up to this movement because, especially the middle class, lower middle class, because the poorest of the poor, they've got nothing left to give. So the middle class, especially the lower middle class, are starting to wake up to the fact that huh, they're next. The common charge laid against the Occupy movement is that it doesn't have a clear agenda. It's not about demands, it's not about this, it's about drawing attention. Like, if we've done, we've been here for, what, less than six months, and we've changed the conversation of the world. And how is the conversation being changed? With transparency is the key. Because that's a big problem in our government right now, a lack of transparency. We have an invisible government that does what they do, and they present a completely different facade to, uh, to, the, the, to the population. And what we're seeing through that now, again, thanks to the internet, the truth is out there for those that care to look. Occupy is one of the primary ways counter-narratives and marginalized perspectives are being presented to society. The issues they're covering don't seem to be substantively addressed in the current media they system. They're relying on the corporate media to give them their information. We can no longer do that in this country. We don't have a free press anymore. I mean, it's been kawaii. It's become nothing more than a commodity for sale. The anti-war movements of the 60s saw dehumanization in the draft and the indiscriminate bombings and the battered bodies of soldiers and civilians. The civil rights protesters saw dehumanization in the lynch mobs and the institutionalized injustice of separate but equal. Now, the Occupy protesters are bringing to light the dehumanization that comes from the commodification no of human society. People healthy and well. It's about, again, making money for a few people at the expense of, a mi of, of the many. Uh, healthcare, perfect. I have a friend whose uh, mother just passed away a year ago, this past December. They had insurance, private insurance. They had money. With somebody sitting behind a desk, I think it would be more cost effective to let her linger and die than treat her and make her well. So much for uh, private health care. Again, it's not about health care, it's about making money. We have enough resources on this planet to suit and fill everybody's needs. Unfortunately, we don't have nearly enough to fill a few people's greed. 
But distinctions should be drawn between the protest movements of the 60s and those happening today. The differences between the protests of today yeah. and the 60s? Yes. A um, couple of distinctions. One is in the 60s, a lot of the protesters were actually being very aggressive and even attacking the troops coming home from Vietnam. So baby killers, murderers, things like that. What we realize today, we don't do that. Uh, it's a commander in chief, it's the military leaders that are to be held accountable. Still, there is much the two movements have in common. They, they said the civil rights movement was over so many times before it actually even started. Like right now it might just be an idea, but it's, you know, got a long ways to go. Governments historically respond to protests which challenge their power with suppression. These attempts to maintain the status quo can undermine movements or even prevent them from taking hold. Such are the challenges facing anti-establishment groups like Occupy today. I was watching it live yesterday as they tried to retake Sakati Park up in uh, New York. And they did take it back for a while and got kicked back out. And I, I want to say to my brethren and sisters up in uh, New York, they kicked you out yesterday. Go back today. Go back tomorrow. Go back the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. Do not be stopped. Do not let them stop you. They tried to stop us here. Daryl Issa, the richest, most corrupt member of Congress, felt that the Occupy movement was a threat to his power and corruption. Of course it is. It is. Absolutely exactly. it is. Um, but as Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Occupy, as well as other movements, are responding to these challenges by using the internet. I just want to point out the other big, big difference between the protests of today and the 60s is the internet. Yes. It's global information and it's instantaneous. And I think the powers that be are realizing that too. That's why you see things such as ACTA and PIPA and SOPA, where they're trying to control and censor the internet too and the information available to people. However, with the amount of people that have access to it, I don't think they're going to be able to stop it. The future of movements like Occupy remains unclear. What is apparent is how they have destabilized the social sphere, challenging assumptions about the way our economic and political systems operate. The rights movement, for instance, like you could say it took 17 years. Um, yeah. Some say it took 25 years. Some people say it's still going on now. Um, you know, what makes something successful? Despite the tremendously difficult path which lies ahead of them, the occupiers remain optimistic about their goals. I mean, how much is enough? Greed isn't just a, uh, isn't just a sin, it, it is a disease. And some of these people have it bad, like the Koch brothers for instance. And you know what? Occupy is the cure. And our resolve is greater than they could possibly imagine. We are not going to give up. These issues are way too important.